Welcome to American Players Theater Talk Backs to Go. I'm Buzz Kemper, and I invite you to take a walk up the hill with Orange Schroeder and me as Orange chats with director John Langs and actor Jim DeVita about APT's production of An Iliad by Lisa Peterson and Dennis O'Hare, translated from Homer's Iliad by Robert Fagels. We are here to discuss a play called An Iliad with director John Langs and Jim DeVita, who plays the poet in this retelling of Homer's Iliad that was written by Lisa Peterson and Dennis O'Hare. Uh, Lisa Peterson was the director in the original production, and Dennis O'Hare alternated playing the solo actor with another actor when the play debuted. So it's it's not an old play. Obviously, uh, the Iliad itself is over 30... 3,000 years old, but um, tell us about this version uh, and how it differs from what Homer wrote. Well, I think what Lisa Peterson and Dennis O'Hare were after was a very fresh take on uh, the question that the Iliad, I think, through its incredible poetry, tries to answer, and that being what is the cost of war and why do we go to war? And these two great artists were working around the country just after 9-11, and their question was, you know, what are the plays that really address this thing directly? Um, And that's the kind of work that they wanted to be um, creating. So they found this wonderful adaptation of um, the Iliad, and they put all of the words into this into the mouth of an imagined poet who tells the story of an Iliad by telling the story of Hector and Achilles um, and all of the pride and hubris and humanity that they bring, their conflict brings to illuminate that story. And this is not the first time that the two of you have worked together on this play. No, we did this, we, it was just last year, right? Yeah. yeah. At the Milwaukee Repertory Theater, we, um, <clears throat> we did the uh, first production together of this uh, a year ago. Um, in the winter, and that was the first time that we started working on this play, and then we're fortunate, and, and it's exciting and scary to remount it and, and also re-envision it for American Players Theater. It's a completely different production um, you, than the I understand Milwaukee. that in Milwaukee it was set, uh, you were a Vietnam vet, and... It, um, well, that was never stated, but okay. I certainly presented things that people made that up, so I'm glad that they made, made that up, because that's what in my mind I was playing. But actually, I just, the, the poet to me, um, the conceit of the play in Milwaukee and of the play is that I've been around for 3,000 years telling this story and I'm kind of doomed by the gods to ke- keep telling it until mankind stops using war to answer their problems. And Which so, was the premise of the Iliad. Yeah. So Brilliant. obviously I've not been very successful. I'm still telling <laughs> the story, so that's the irony and of it. Um, so uh, in Milwaukee, I, I think uh, visually I could have been from many, many different eras. I happened to associate with the Vietnam era because I was when I was growing up, I just missed the draft, and I remember praying that it would the war would be over by the time I was old enough. So I used that as a frame of reference, basically. And many people um, saw that in the character, uh, but other people saw their, you know, war veterans in that character. And tell us about the APT production. So, you know, it's always a challenge when you are asked to uh, remount. There's this theory about, you know, how do you capture lightning in a bottle twice? And I felt like we had a really strong outing uh, at the Milwaukee Rep. But, you know, there's a lot of incredibly smart people here, and we were particularly on our design team. And when we were coming to the Touchstone Theater, which is a much smaller venue than the Powerhouse, which is about 850 seats there, and what are we down to? Three... To something it's a little over 200 a little over 200 and we were just looking at the room <clears throat> and the room very much to me um, looks like um, uh, in in a great way uh, a place for telling stories but also sort of a lecture hall um, and we were thinking about what is a context um, for this particular production that would have all of the um, resonance um, and um, and fit this room and fit this event. So we're presenting essentially um, uh, a hall, like a lecture hall, 
where a professor who uh, may or may not be struggling with his own demons enters a space on a college campus somewhere in time that may or may not be um, under siege by political protest outside the door. You know, um, we talked a lot about Kent State. We talked a lot about um, the nature of telling this story to a group of, of, of students who would be of the age where their lives could be irrevocably changed or damaged by the outcome of political decisions that they weren't necessarily at this point um, invited to participate in. Um, and I think our country's seen a lot of that. Uh, and so to to me, that sort of lit the imaginative fuse that became this production. Um, it's in some ways um, the production is surreal. Um, it is it 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 invites a leap of imagination. And when we leapt, that's kind of where we landed. And I'm, I'm, it's really dynamic and interesting, and adds. Um, a sort of an interactive layer, I think, um, and it challenges us to um, really look at those moments in history where uh, war w w was affecting young people. How do you take the same text that you used in Milwaukee and bring all this additional um, implication to it? I think, you know, we, we just start with a, a what if. What if this was uh, a day like Kent State on a university campus somewhere? What if this gentleman, uh, instead of being propelled out of the ether by the gods, had to teach a class this day? What if he wasn't even going to teach the class of an Iliad, but it was so, he felt so strongly that these were the words that this class needed on this particular day. So all of those what ifs lead us into the rehearsal room. Um, and then together we start really testing ourselves, answering questions, demanding clarity out of each other and our designers to sort of pull the whole evening together. But I'm assuming you can't add any words or, or context. Oh, no, there's, no, there's mm. nothing added at yeah. all. It's just a, a, a different interpretation of the script, you know, or contextualization, I would say. Yeah. Not really interpretation of the script. And uh, and also in, in that, in my imagination, looking at an audience where in my imagination I'm seeing not only people that are not involved in the po decisions politically that are going to change their lives, they could be the kids that are going... Um, uh, the, the boys and girls that are going over to fight whatever this war is. So, and as I describe in the Iliad, the Iliad, you know, there's a 19 year old boys on the beach too in the Iliad. You know, we all we think of Ajax and these mythical. You know, there's, you know, almost 200,000 Greek men. Many of them are 18, 17, 19 years old. Um, and when you start thinking of things like that, it, and that's part of the play, I think, is we think of those grand, grand mythical stories and say, well, wait. Can you really imagine what it was like to be on that beach? You just left your mom and you're 17 years old and you're there for nine years. You know, what, and we're trying to get people just to imagine, can you see that? That's um, what Lisa Peterson and Dennis O'Hare, who developed the script, that phrase is, is said, I don't know how many times I say that, eight, seven, eight times in the play, do you see, do you see, can you imagine, can you picture? And um, so this, 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 uh, idea that we have works with that really wonderfully. And it worked just as well in Milwaukee, too, as far as uh, what to do. It's very interesting that the play will bear yeah. um, this. That was the kind of a test. I mean, Milwaukee was operatic. 850 seats and, and one tremendous actor, and we had to kind of uh, reach the back. And so our whole design ethos was built out of like, how do you um, expand this metaphor into this space? Um, and, you know, I think the interesting thing about that was uh, when we moved it into a smaller space, there was an emphasis in a larger space on a visual nature, um, on a sort of uh, athletic reach, um, uh, a real ambition to um, fill a space uh, with light and sound. And what's gorgeous about the script, of course, is it is, uh, he calls it a song so that the poem is sung. And here you get, I think, right up close, the nuance of language, which is really more befitting um, the spine of what APT is about. I mean, if you could boil APT down to anything, and we talk about it over and over again, it's the word and the story. 
you know, the actor with the word and the story. Um, so that's, I think it's a great uh, reimagining for this, this place. And of course, the original poem was in uh, dactylic hexameter, and mm -hmm. I'm assuming the language is quite different in this. Well, it's a mixture of prose and dactylic hexameter, and this is the Fagel's uh, translation. Um, um, so there's, uh, you know, they'll have small sections, you know, say seven or eight lines in, in verse, and there'll be a, a half a page of prose. And that's kind of fun, is going in and out of it. So uh, you can hear the sound of when I'm, you know, if... Uh, you have to do something, because people on the ride some. home will listen to this. Well, I mean, even the beginning, was, it, we start with traditional, ancient, men in the e de te a per la dio aquileos. You know, and this is the ancient Greek. But then we take the Fagel's translation, too, which is um, uh, kind of, sing, you know, sing... What is the first one? Rage. Rage, goddess, rage, sing the rage of Peleus' son, Achilles, murderers, doomed, that cost the Achaeans countless losses, hurling down to the house of death so many sturdy. So you can still hear the rhythm in that. And, uh, um, and then we'll stop, and then I'll talk to you like this. And then we'll go back and do this. So it's fun to go in and out of it. And, it's where, and, and the rhythm is there. And, and of course, that was a 3,000-seat house that Homer was, or whoever Homer was, was playing to. And that's why you use big rhythmic choices like that. You're trying to get 3,000 people to hear this thing. No amplification. It also uh, probably helped with memorizing it. And of course, oh, it originally was, yeah. was oral tradition rather than written. Um, speaking of sound, tell me about the cellist. Oh. Oh, I love her cellist. Yeah, Alicia. She's remarkable. Um, you, you know, there, there was a nudge um, in the, uh, the author's notes about sound and music. And of course, much of the Iliad, particularly the beginning of it, is a call to the heavens to be filled with a muse because the muse would help your heart open up and communicate to the heart of the audience. Muses, he says over and over again, muses, don't let me do this alone. Um, and we chose um, that the muse who is silent speaks only through a single instrument of the cello, which to me is the warmest and most like the human voice. Um, you know, when I was looking to cast this role, I said she has to stand in for the feminine in the play in many ways. So Andromache, Hecuba, Athena, um, she often um, is sort of you know, the yin-yang aspect of uh, the performance is balanced a great deal by this choice to bring in a terrific cellist. And where does the music come from? Is it composed for the this production? Or? It is, yeah. Uh, Josh Schmidt is the composer, and he did a fantastic job. In fact, he parked himself in our early rehearsals and just um, demanded um, the time and the space very successfully, I think, to create a score that was um, as delicate and important as the rest of the, what is said. Yeah. And uh, having just the cellist and, and one actor on stage, what are the challenges of that? You can speak to Yeah, well, I love having another person out there. <laughs> well, in the last, uh, I've, I've done my share of one-person shows, so I know how, how daunting it can be and lonely sometimes. <laughs> Uh, but the last production in Milwaukee, she was about 40 feet above me, behind me, behind a scrim. Um, so there was a little bit of interaction with her, but she was very godlike and unreachable. And now she's on the stage sitting on a chair in front of me. And I love it because she, she not only inspires me as my muse, uh, she also guides me if I get off track in a story or she'll rebuke me if I start going on a tangent. And she can do that all with music. Uh, we can be on the same track. She can feel for me when it, the man's Homer's heart starts to break, or another, or he's playing a character whose heart is breaking. And so it's amazing what she can bring orally to this experience. I mean, she can make the sound of a child wailing on that. You know, she can make the sound of a, of war. She can do percussive things on it. So we actually have a dialogue. I have dialogue in this production mm -hmm. with music and with her eyes, too, which is wonderful. So she's a great, great addition to the piece. Certainly a unique way to tell a timeless story. Thank you both so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Talkbacks to Go is a production of Orange Tree Imports, 
Pro Video and Film, and Audio for the Arts. Your host is Oren Schroeder. I'm Buzz Kemper. Our music is by Steve Tibbetts and is used by permission of the artist. Please find us on iTunes and YouTube under APT Talkbacks to Go. Thank you for listening. <laughs>